Aloha. Happy Friday. I'm Kaui Lucas. Uh, this week with a little centipede bite on my lip if it looks a little strange. Um, and um, speaking of um, bites, <laughs> Uh, tomorrow is going to be a big one for Javier Ocasio, who's my guest today. He is running for Congress for CD1, and he is an amazingly progressive young man. He's, he's actually older than he looks. I just want to say your, <laughs> your age because you look about 19. You're really 38. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> I get 20s a lot. <laughs> And, and, and you spent 15 years in, in the uh, military industrial complex, didn't you? That's right. So yes, you I speak did. from a experience when you, when, you talk about, when you talk about that. So um, you came on my radar because I was, I was trying to figure out who to vote for. Um, I had my reasons for not voting for the front runners, and you know, it's like, well, who are these other people? And I. I read your interviews and I listened to your speaker's corner on Think Tech Hawaii. I said, wow, he's pretty interesting. What's his story? Um, and now you're here. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. So um, for those who haven't done their research on you, Javier, tell, tell us the story of, of what motivated you to do this really big step. Well, I. Um I had been participating in a lot of activism since my daughter's death. That's what, you know, was the main catalyst. And how long ago was that? That was, she passed away April 2010. So that was six years ago. And uh, in March 2011, I left the military as a result of that. And after that, I was just riddled with questions. Why, 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 why? As any parent would be if, you know, their child passed away. And the answers that I got as I investigated the causes of her death opened up doors that led to more questions, that led to more questions. And the root cause of the problem was corruption, lobbying, the pharmacy industrial complex, I guess you could say, um, you know, the government. And I was just, I was appalled at what I discovered. Um, and I, f I just felt like I had to do something about it. You know, I, death is the ultimate price anyone pays for a mistake or you know for a wrongdoing and you know children should be paying that price so i did everything i could um you know to try to make a difference you know went to occupy wall street and then after that went to dc protests had marched um you know joined several groups uh, and then when i moved to san francisco i joined another progressive group and attended regular meetings and marches and tried to make a difference then when i finally moved to hawaii the focus of coming to Hawaii was just to focus on healing and recovery. Uh, but then when Bernie Sanders' campaign started, that fire got reignited again, and I started to take steps to not just educate myself on his campaign, but to see what I could do to help. And um, you know, eventually I made the decision that I had to help in a way that would strategically help Bernie's vision, and that was to get progressives into Congress. So regardless of the odds, I made the choice. I filed the paperwork, and here I am. So were you able to meet Jane Sanders when she was here? I did. A very lovely woman. Very, very lovely. Very, very kind. The compassion from her is, um, you know, when you meet certain people, you can feel their compassion. Other, to other people, you can feel them trying to be compassionate. <laughs> no, she was just, her compassion was just one of those that just exudes. So uh, before your daughter's death, um, you were an active duty serviceman. Yes. Um, Originally from Puerto Rico. Correct. Uh, so you would be the, would you be the first congressman from Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico, I don't know if I would be the first congressman originally from Puerto Rico. Um, but Anyway, I, I you understand been. islands even though you yes. haven't been in Hawaii terribly long, right? right? You've been here how long? A total of five years now. Okay. Five years. And you have family, you have a brother here yes. and his family and yes. so forth. Okay. So, um, Talk about Kuwait and or Iraq and the role that you were playing and that the United States was playing and how that has helped to form where you are today. Well, when we got to Kuwait and to Iraq, a few things became really, really clear, just undeniably so. And I'll give you one example for Kuwait. So in Kuwait, um, there is a road 
that's lined on the left and the right hand side of this road with nothing but all of the vehicles that the US military has destroyed, whether they are friendly or enemy, civilian, uh, emergency medical service, helicopter, you name it. It's just lined on this road and you're not allowed to take pictures or video or anything like that. But when you drive down this road, which is really long and it's just riddled with all the destruction that we've created, you get your first glimpse at all the things that we have done you know, in that country alone. Then once you make it to Iraq and you start to, even amongst the bubble that you work in, in your section or your platoon or your company, certain things start to become clear. And that is when you watch TV. You look at the narrative that's portrayed that the people back home see versus the narrative you know to be true where you are. And there's usually a huge difference. Can you give us a line from that narrative that you, um, that we didn't hear mm -hmm. back in the United States? Um, it's really that tough did. to remember. Um, oh, it's all right. It's just been a long time. Yeah. So there was a, a cognitive dissonance between mm -hmm. what you were hearing from the media and what you were living on a day to day. Yes. As a soldier, how did that? Um, how did you? How did you work that out? Um, or didn't you? That's what I call. I was morally compromised. My morals, my ethics, my values were compromised on a daily basis because you're forced to acknowledge that your duty and your role per the contract you signed and the oath that you took is X. But as a human being, as you witness certain things, as you see certain things, you know, your spirit, your soul calls out and you, this is inherently wrong. So a lot of that time that I spent in Iraq was spent focusing doing my job and trying not to think about the other side of that coin about the things we were doing and things that were happening because there's one particular incident that a friend of mine told me after the deployment which he was you know alongside me on that i had no idea about because certain information is compartmentalized based on your mission requirements right so as a result of that you don't have access to information um, that i might have and vice versa and we're not allowed to talk about it but after my daughter's death one of my friends who was on you know some of these uh, flights that were confidential told me about a couple of instances and where um, you know, we literally killed dozens upon dozens of women and children and we were responsible for picking up their bodies, or my friend was, and putting them in unmarked graves. And I was like, that's, that's us, that's the, the good guys doing that. So when my daughter passed away, he felt it because he was carrying all these little kids that were charred and burned, you know. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of things they don't tell you you know, about what we've done over there that we know about, uh, that, that the national narrative can't afford to have, so they omit it. So when you came back mm -hmm. and started um, getting active in these groups, you, uh, the Occupy movement. Talk right. about the Occupy movement. Well, um, I was investigating my daughter's death and we had already, um, you know, filed suit once we had made certain discoveries and once the Occupy movement started, uh, you know, I paid attention to what was being put out on the internet versus what was being put out in the national media. And there was a huge contrast in the narrative. And I felt this ginormous pull to go out there and participate, uh, to do whatever I could to contribute in any way. And Can you give any went. sort of specific example of that, Javier? I, my initial intent in going over there was to try to help them to be more efficient and more focused in their own perceived oh, as goals. As a soldier. As a yeah. soldier, right? All you, right. You, you tell me you want to do X, I want to help you do X, especially if I believe that's for the greater good. Uh, and I went there, and <laughs> they were very, very suspicious. They thought I was an infiltrator. They thought I was a plant because of how I stand, how I talk, how I dress, you know, because of years in the military. So they, nobody ever really trusted me. But I partook in the marches, you know, I did everything I could to support and help and just, and just be there. So what did you learn um, as you were living uh, with the Occupy movement in D.C.? I mean, that is certainly a very, <laughs> you will be the only senator, I'm quite sure, who has had that experience. Um, the biggest thing that I learned is, is that it's not, it wasn't a bunch of teenagers. It wasn't a bunch of young kids. There were grandparents, there were parents, there was even one great grandmother, you know, who was out there. There were children and teachers that would go there on a daily basis and try to get information and educate themselves because the kids, check this out, the kids knew that what they were watching on TV was a lie. 
So they asked their teachers to take them down there for like a field trip, and they did. And I managed to talk to some of those classes, um, and they were all astounded as to what the narrative that I was able to provide versus what they were seeing on TV. So there's this fundamental connect that we are all making versus the deceptions we're being broadcast and versus what we know to be true without even having to be there. So even though the Occupy movement as a whole got a lot of bad rap, that was manufactured. Because um, if you actually participated, if you actually went there, aside from all the disagreements, aside from all the humanity that you could witness there in those microcosms, um, there was everyone. There were grandparents, there were parents, there were children, there were sisters, uh, you know, there were twins. Um, you know, even, the, even some of the homeless put their homelessness aside and ask, what can we do to help you guys to help us? Wait, put their homelessness aside. Yeah. What does that mean? That means when you usually live on the street as a, uh, and you're homeless, uh, through no fault of your own, your first instinct is survival. You know, you have to get food, you have to shelter, you know, sometimes people compete for space, to safe zones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there were several people that let those concerns to the side, completely did not worry about themselves and asked what they could do to help us. And um, that spoke a lot, and I got to know some of those people. Some of those people spoke multiple languages. One of them had a master's degree. Um, others fell on bad times. One of them, whole family passed away, and then like the courts and the banks get in and was left with nothing, and then you know was left homeless. It's just story after story after story uh, of the reality of our scenario is just made clear. So I think on a broader scale, um, after these. Uh, uh, primaries, the primary season, the leading up the, to the conventions, the dissonance between um, what was uh, portrayed in social media versus the corporate media, right. I, think, I think the message is a little, little easier to believe now. Do you, do you get that feeling? Yes. Yeah, uh, I do. Because uh, even people that don't have the experience to substantiate what they believe to be a deception are being clued in on the reality of the deception. Um, and it's, it's finally taking hold, finally taking hold, and people are not, not only using their voice, but they're seeking out information. So fewer and fewer people are looking to the tube and more to the internet. So now you're living in Hawaii. You've been yes. here for a while. You've, yes. you've gotten your, your feet wet um, and have been learning some of our history. Yeah. So one of the, the focuses I have on the show is, is talking about the, um, the future of Native Hawaiians, the future of the governance of Hawaii as perhaps uh, a sovereign uh, nation again, or some sort of um, some sort of solution to the um, overthrow and its aftermath. Right. So. You, <clears throat> we spoke briefly about this um, on the phone, and I thought you had some remarkable uh, uh, ideas. So would you talk about that, please? Well, as far as Hawaii, I've always felt that Hawaii was a jewel in the Pacific. You know, uh, when I was stationed in South Korea, and I came out here on vacation to know whether or not this is where I wanted to live, uh, I had to sign an extra contract just to be able to come here. And then, you know, as my life changed and then I moved back over here, uh, I was so ecstatic to be back. And uh, but the difference being that this time I really sunk my teeth in about the history, the culture, the land, you know, and I'm still learning. But my, the way I see Hawaii, the way I see a lot of the problems, to me, it makes too much sense um, that we, for example, we spent billions of dollars on a rail program, right? Because we believe it to be so important and or so necessary. But there are other things that if we had that much of an investment on, we could solve many of Hawaii's issues you know, right away and for the long term and improve everyone's quality of life. Well, Javier, we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, let's talk about that. And then let's invite listeners to call in to 415-871-2474 if you have a question for Javier. You're watching SingTech Hawaii, which streams live on SingTechHawaii.com, uploads to YouTube.com, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from SingTech. 
Hello, I'm Patrick Bratton, host of Global Connections here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm also a professor of political science at Hawaii Pacific University. So this show is one of the ways that we collaborate between ThinkTech Hawaii and Hawaii Pacific University, where I talk on my show with a lot of guests about issues dealing with Hawaii, the United States, and the world. So I look forward to seeing and interacting with you uh, online and on my show. Thank you very much. Aloha! We invite you to join us on our Keys to Success show, which is live on the ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. My name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Our goal for our weekly show, Keys to Success, is to provide professional and personal development tools and profound insights on how to achieve success in life, career, and or business. We have a theme focus for each show, and our guests have achieved success in their life, career, and our business. They are frank and candid with their advice and commentaries. As this is a live show, we have live mess-ups as well, which are fun to watch. As you see. <laughs> Resources, success tips from our guests, and other information can be accessed at newmanconsultingservices.com or Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A dot org. We also invite you to call us to join our weekly conversations or tweet us if you have any questions or comments. We want you to participate in the show. I'm Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. And I'm John, the other half of the duo. We're looking forward to seeing you on our next Keys to Success show, aired live Thursdays at 11 a.m. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas. Today we are speaking with Javier Ocasio, who is a candidate for U.S. Senate. Congress. 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 Right. Well, um, in the um, uh, District 1, CD, CD1 here for Hawaii. And um, we were talking about um, how his um, really um, transformative experiences of being in the military in Iraq and Kuwait and then um, his daughter's death and um, spending time with the Occupy movement has informed his ethics, transformed his ethics to a place where he feels compelled to run um, for office. And um, it's, not a, it's not a small thing. Um, no, so, um, uh, to stand up for your, what you truly believe and know to be true. Um, there are people who, who think that um, uh, progressives are um, making up uh, stories um, about the status quo and the, the conditions that we cur currently live on as being wild and what do you say to those people who think it's all a conspiracy theory and, um, um, you know, we should just <laughs> shut up and business as usual? It's a matter of comparing the conceptual versus the experiential, right? So if my true life experience conflicts with what you believe without research and or experience, then you have a disconnect. And then the discussion should take the form of, all right, then may I inform you or have you done any research? And if those type of people reply no, and they're just affirmed in what they believe without experience or research, um, you know, there's nothing you can do to convince them. All you can state is that, well, please just try to understand that my reality, what I have lived through, what I have scars from, the tears I have shed and the blood that has come out of my body is a testament to what I am uh, trying to change and make better. So forgive me if we conflict, and forgive me if we end up at opposite ends of that battle but it's necessary. So your direct experience of reality is sometimes in conflict with the way we wish we were. Right. Right, okay. So as you said, that takes a certain amount of, um, on the receiving side, someone has to be open to having their pretty picture of the world, and especially the United States, um, uh, demolished actually yes. <laughs> it's a very traumatizing thing it is it is and i understand that because i used to live in the military bubble right i was an army dependent and then i grew up as an army dependent and straight in high school joined the military so i became active duty and then for 15 years that dominated my world view it wasn't until that bubble was burst 
that I had shock after shock. I've, I have what I've been calling a crash course on life since 2010. One of the, uh, you spoke about resilience and, um, and your role in the military is having to learn how to do things you'd never done before and then teach others how to right. do things they hadn't done before. I thought that's a, that is a remarkable skill. Resilience is uh, across the board um, the number one survival, uh, one, number one predictor of um, survival and, and health, both mentally and physically. So um, I think you're well prepared <laughs> in spite of your um, extreme experiences. Um, so talk some more about uh, your vision for Hawaii and how we could, how we can do things here that would make for uh, a more compassionate and wonderful way. Well, the, the first thing that I believe we can do here in Hawaii is accelerate, and, and I mean in a fast pace, our adoption of solar. Because the biggest cost that the average person, low, middle, to you know, very, very low to no income is power, electricity, whether that's gasoline or whether that's for your house or apartment or room that you rent. Good Lord knows there's a whole bunch of room renters here. Um, and if you want to give them immediate relief, if you want to provide them a boost so that they can re-inject some of that money back into the economy, is you need to take that burden of having to pay for power all the time the way that we are right now by giving them solar. See, solar has been adopted predominantly by those that have the money but can already afford to pay for power at the prices that they are. That should be turned on its head. The investment should be on the lower end of the scale to relieve the poor and the low income from um, their <laughs> additional expenses as a result of the power of price of power here in Hawaii so that then you can bring that up and transition to completely clean. So maybe instead of um, focusing so much on SNAP food benefits or something like that to develop or develop an e-SNAP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Something for uh, SNAP is the food s supplementation. Right. Um, uh, so, how do how do you see um, uh, specifically for the na Native Hawaiian population um, addressing the historical uh, wrongs? The way I see that is real simple. The longer we take to correct what was done, the higher the price we're going to pay. And because it's been so long, we're going to pay a steep price. The way that I see it, and that price is. Uh, going to come in the huge fights and arguments that are going to happen if an idea like the one I'm about to tell you, um, you know, takes any kind of root. And that is that we try to give all the land back to them and create a land trust here in Hawaii. You know, you, if we cannot remove the buildings, we cannot remove the people, can't remove all the cars, but we can give the land back to who originally it belonged. We can give them the custody of it. We can create a, a new type of land trust. Um, here in Hawaii, and that would create a new dynamic in which the Native Hawaiians would have their land back, and there would be a huge new dynamic that would have to be figured out, that experts would have to come in and, you know, give their two cents and do this whole thing. Um, but I believe it's a necessary step, because only by disconnecting the land from the buildings and the values of those two can you re-empower a people that have been disempowered and then keep the people that have been here the whole time doing you know, the oppressing, so to speak, or the occupying, we'll say, um, in check. Because right now it's extremely lopsided. You know, the people with the money, the people that own the land uh, are calling the shots, putting the pressure, you know, making the deals. But if you take the land and you give it back, and then you create a mutual land trust of some sort, uh, then you could re-empower a nation that was you know, disempowered and create a new dynamic that would um, bring a lot of relief to people because you wouldn't have to pay for land and a house. So once again, Javier, it sounds like you're asking up t us to give up um, our delusions <laughs> and our addiction to uh, real estate uh, inflation uh, uh, of investment, sorry, yeah. I meant to say uh, real estate investment, which um, really is the, the ground um, on which the local economy rests. We, whether it's, you talk about it through the military or tourism um, or just land ownership, um, the primary means of, of wealth in Hawaii is based on the land. Right. So, well, that's quite
quite a little revolution. <laughs> Got to challenge the status quo, right? Not just appear, but you know, economically, right. we can't continue the way that we And are. is there some real-world model that you um, know of that might help get a we always study everything before we do it. Right, so right. we would so have to do a study on this. I got the idea from um, you know, Burlington, Vermont, and the land trust that they have over there. So if anybody were to research how they did their land trust and how that's organized, uh, you know, I don't have all the details memorized and how it works, but the bottom line was you know, they created a land trust, which is a private entity, and the land value was disconnected from all the housing values. So if you purchased a house, you would purchase the house value itself. And value would be added to the house solely based upon the improvements that you made you know, on the house over time. And then you'd pay a small fee for the lease for the duration that you own the house, something like $25 a month. Um, and then when you sell the house, even if the house appreciates a lot of value, you only get a small amount of that back should you sell the house, but you still make some. But what it does is it cuts so much out of the price of a house that it makes it more affordable for people that otherwise wouldn't be able to purchase a home. Javier, we only have about a minute and a half. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you are not in the Army, and I am not ma'am. <laughs> um, what would you like to, to say about, um, about tomorrow's election, about what, what you feel? All I want to say is that we face a great deal of many issues. And we can either do what we're attached to doing, which is what makes us comfortable, or we can do what is necessary, which is going to make us very uncomfortable. But if we're serious about creating change, if we're serious about the environment, if we're serious about saving lives, and uplifting and empowering people, then we have to let go of our attachment to the way we've been doing things if we really want to adopt the new. Whether that means putting new people into office or re-electing the good ones. Either way, you got to challenge the status quo, whether that's in here or in here. Wow. Um, so uh, we had a, a little discussion about your next steps. What, what's next? The yeah. special election. The special election. Yes. I'm going to sign my name and fill the papers so that I can run for the special election to hopefully uh, occupy the office um, from November 8th to January 3rd, if I'm not mistaken, for that two-month time period. Thank you so much, Javier. Best of luck tomorrow. Thank and you, you got my vote. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>